Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. So it's together in athletics, and probably I could use this illustration. WWF wrestling, or what is it called? How many know what I'm talking about, wrestling? Sometimes they have what are known as tag team matches. You're in there, in the ring, and the opponent's coming at you, and you're just wrestling your heart. I don't know, it's mostly played up anyway. And so you're trying to reach out, because when you just don't have any more strength, tag team means as long as your opponent can can touch your fingers or you could touch their fingers, that means that you're released and they can jump in and use their energy to take over this opponent. And then this opponent says, whoa, this guy's coming after me. So he's going over to his side of the mat in the ring and he's trying to get someone to touch those fingers so that the next group can come in. So you have a partner. And so what you're doing is you are striving together. You're in athletics together against an opponent. Well, instead of looking at mere opponents now, I want us to look in terms of we are striving together for the faith of the gospel. That means that we might disagree on whether we want pepperonis or or, or mushrooms on our pizza. That doesn't matter. We might disagree a little bit on music, and I know there's a line on some music and words and stuff like that, but sometimes we have to paint a broader stroke. And remember, what we don't paint a broader stroke on is this that the Word of God is the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture, that Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God are part of the Trinity, that we don't split on the um, um, salvation being by grace through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing, that we believe that this Scripture is what God has for us today. That's the mighty part of the faith that we agree on, and that's what this passage is speaking about and how critical this is for us. And I pray that we buy into that. Let me tell you a sad story. Because sometimes you can strive together for the defense of the gospel, and it doesn't always mean that you're going to have a, uh, a, ch- a cherry, super-duper, shave-ice-type wedding and marriage and life together. There's another man by the name of Adoniram Judson. I've read about every biography that I could get on this guy because he went and he faced all sorts of opposition. First of all, he marries a lady whom he hasn't known for very long, but because of her heart turned toward the Lord and their commitment to the gospel, and his heart turned toward the Lord and the commitment to the gospel, and they're willing to step out on faith to go to a foreign land, Burma, that they decided to go overseas to Burma. And when they did, they left as being a belief system that you were sprinkled instead of baptized by immersion. And on their trip over to Burma, they were studying the word very carefully. They had all their commentaries and their Greek books that they had at that time. And then they came to the conclusion that for a person to go to heaven, it was by faith alone. But once they trusted Christ as Savior, they had to identify with the Lord by being baptized by immersion after they were saved as an outward sign. So on board ship, they realized that they were receiving money and financial support to go there under one belief system. And now they've changed their belief system on that that value of baptism. So they talk together between Luther Rice and Adam Judson, and Luther Rice says, you're married, so, and you're here with your wife, so you stay here. You both can't go back. I will go back, and I will then tell them that we are resigning from our mission organization, and we are totally living by faith for God to take care of us, and I'll try to give you some support. So he goes to a land he's never been to, has to learn a language he never knew, and try to communicate to people who were so anti whenever they'd hear about God because they were so embedded with their own belief system. So when Judson arrived there, it wasn't long before he started to speak for the faith. Soon after that, he was thrown in jail, but not our kind of jail. They had to make a jail for him that was like a pigsty. It was so filled with filth in there. And when you go to jail in those days, in that country, nobody took care of you. You were in jail. Basically, they put you into a box and let you die unless someone else brought you food. His wife then had to bring him food. And she would have to sneak it to him and sneak it to him because they would try to um, harass her as being a woman and all that stuff. So she would then scrape some garbage through the cracks in this pigsty to get to him. But yet together, their hearts were knit together for love for the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. It wasn't long after that he said to her, could you at least smuggle me in a Bible? So she then began to give a little bit of food to the guards so that the guards eventually would give him a, like a blanket, like a little a jacket. And so she hid pieces of the Bible in that, smuggled it in through the guards to her husband so he would then have the word. He never lost his faith. She never lost their faith. They never lost their calling to the Burmese people to give them the gospel. Well, then he realized that she was pregnant. 
And then she, he found out that she ceased coming to see him anymore. And found out that she gave birth, and then she died. They were knit together, they strove together for the faith of the gospel. And so not all of it's going to end a very positive way. The only thing I can tell you this is that when she died, probably a horrible death, she stood before the king of kings and God opened up the windows of heaven and blessed her and that there will be rewards at the judgment seat of Christ for her faithfulness. And so what happened is just what they did. They kept the main thing, the main thing. So in your marriage, you keep the main thing, the main thing. It's your spiritual life development, the gospel. You keep the main thing, the main thing on your job. It's not about money and bucks. It's about your character and manifesting that you're a citizen of heaven. It's not about your little views and your committees and teams, even at church. It's going to be about that you're set for the defense of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We keep the main thing, the main thing, serving together in evangelism. Here's number three. So it's not just serving together in evangelism. He says this, that we will stay together in courage. And I believe that's probably where we could use the word encourage, that we encourage one another and that we're going to stay together in courage. Look at the verse. It says this, with one mind striving together. In other words, we think the same way, we feel the same way, we speak the same thing. We're striving together on the same team. And it says, not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. All right, let me see if I can make some sense out of the phrase terrified by your adversaries and proof of perdition for you, because those are words that our young people probably aren't quite as familiar with. All right, when you hear the word terrified, you think of something that happens that kind of wakes you up in the middle of the night, and it's so loud, it startles you, and you see what it is, and you are scared silly with something like that. How many of you have been so terrified it almost took your breath away, you felt like your heart stopped? Would you raise your hand? Has there anybody been terrified by that? All right, I, I, I have not been very much like that. I can tell you I've had a gun held to my head on two occasions. And there's probably some of you that like to hold one too. No, I'm joking. But I've had two hold them. And, and so, yeah, there was a bit of terrifying. That is not what that Greek word means here. Young people, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that you're so terrified of your enemies. You just, God doesn't want to be terrified of our enemies. That word is a different word. It's a word that we would translate today. It would be the word that we're startled. It kind of catches us off guard. And generally, we're startled by something that we weren't aware of. Let me give you another illustration. How many of you have ever ridden a horse or into horsemanship? If you're riding horses, if you've ever done that. Have you ever noticed how sometimes a horse will sometimes hear something or see something that will spook the horse and the horse will, you know, kind of. So he's, he's terrified, yeah, but really he's more startled by that. And now once you look at it, it's really nothing. How many of you have a cat at the house and all you got to do is just kind of the wall and the cat goes, yeah, you know, well, it's not really terrified. What is this? I'm just hitting the wall. That's all. I'm not shooting the cat, but it's startled by that. And so what this passage is saying here, that you who are Christians who have decided to live together for the defense of the gospel, that nothing should startle you with your enemies. In other words, expect that you will have opposition come your way. Expect it. Don't be startled. Don't be terrified by that. It's going to happen. Now, some of you, it won't happen because you're never going to speak for the Lord. There'll be no gospel presentation from you. There won't be a separated life where you're taking a stand for Christianity in any way. In other words, you'll be a secret service Christian of another country rather than an ambassador for him. But those of you that if you're just new in the faith and you start wanting to come out of your box, come out of the closet, don't be startled. I promise you. I trusted Christ on a Thursday night. I went back to school on Friday because Friday was a day out of school. I got to, I got to my what they call, I don't know if they have them here. Do they have study halls? You have an hour, 45 minutes a day. You just go into a room. It's real quiet. Well, when I was a boy... Boy, I sound like my dad now, don't I? When I was a boy, we had what we had with 45 minutes of study hall. I went in there. I broke all the rules. I was telling everybody around the table that I know that I'm going to heaven now by faith alone in Christ. And I knew I was going to heaven. First thing that hit me is a kid says, you believe you're going into heaven? I said, yes, I do. He says, well, I believe in the fourth, not the third, but the fourth dimension. No, 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 no. And when you go into the fourth dimension, nah, 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 nah. you're kind of just out there floating nah, 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 out there. And you want to know something? I didn't know what to say. I was startled. I thought everybody, when I tell them that, hey, you can go to heaven by faith alone, they'd say, oh, really? Let me do it right now. They didn't do it that way. Right away. Second thing that happened, in the middle of that conversation, I'm starting to get into this thing, and of course, I don't know any answers, so I, I start arguing. Oh, yeah, there is. What do you know? What do you know? What, do you, what about the fourth dimension stuff? The teacher says, you're talking. 
And he made me, can you imagine this, a 16-year-old kid, they put me up against the wall. They drew a circle, and I had to put my nose in that. 16-year-old kid. Now, I'm wired differently. That made me mad. Nobody's going to tell me not tell anybody about Jesus, you know? And that, it, it goes downhill from there. I'm not going to go any further. <laughs> but don't be startled by that. Now, go back to the passage. We stay together in courage. It says, don't be terrified, not in any way, in any way, startled by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of destruction. Now, what that simply means is this, that when they come against you with all of their isms and spasms and belief system that you need to cast down, when they're coming to you and they're startling you with questions you don't know the answer to, all that is, listen, this is so important, all that is telling you is this, they are really lost, they are really going to be destroyed. And therefore, I'm really going to remain strong in my love for them. I'm going to be persevering with them. I'm going to stay with them. I'm going to try to get all their answers. I'll do whatever I can, even in my dying breath. And if they're going to kill me, which that's not going to happen. But if they are, the last thing they're going to hear from me is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that if you believe in him, that's what they're going to hear from me. Because that's a testimony of their destruction. That's a reminder that I can't quit, that I have to stay together in courage. And look, look at the rest of it says, but to you of salvation and that from God. Now, I don't want to get too much to be looking at your lifestyle always to determine whether or not you're saved because all of us have a bad hair day now and then. And if we did that and we doubted our salvation, then we're only as good as our last feeling. So we don't want to go there. But one way you know that you're really saved and probably... What was convincing to me was when I was telling that person that I do believe that there is a heaven and that you can go there by faith alone, and he came back with the fourth dimension and they sent me against the wall. What was happening then as I stood firm for my belief, I knew that I was saved because I ain't going back down. I am a believer, and I'm not going to quibble about this. I didn't realize it, but all of that was confirming the fact that I knew what I believed, and I knew in whom I believed, and that gave me my convinced courage to continue on. And so we would bring, be bringing people to church and everywhere else I could possibly bring them so they would know the Lord. And I've had my friends that I've surfed with and done stuff for years once I got saved come to meetings, stand up in a public meeting, make fun out of me in front of my new friends that were Christian, and walk out of a meeting. I've had that happen. And all that did was I'm going to stay with it because Jesus is my Savior and I can't abandon him. Listen to this quote. It came from John Wesley. He said, Give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I will shake the world. I care not a straw whether they be clergymen like pastors or laymen like people in the pew. And such alone will overthrow the kingdom of Satan and build up the kingdom of God on earth. Some of you may be aware that there's a kind of a cathedral, an, an abbey in England called the Westminster Abbey. Or in the back of that, there's this huge cemetery where the most godly statesmen and Christian had been buried. And there's a, like a tombstone monument there to someone named Lord Lawrence, Lord Lawrence. And on his tombstone, it says this, he feared man so little because he feared God so much. And so as a church, we need to stand together in unity. We need to serve together in evangelism. And then we also need to stay together in courage here as one family for the defense of the gospel. And let me end with number four. We also have to be willing to suffer together in faith. Suffer together in faith. Now, there's going to be some suffering. I don't think in this day and time that probably the greatest suffering we might incur would be the marginalization of our family and friends. You know what I mean by that, kids? The marginalization where one time they really felt good to be around you, but once you started to talk more for the Lord and live a separated life under the gospel, they felt less comfortable for being around you, so they tried to tear you down so you can come back into their value system, but that didn't work, so you stayed where you were, and they said, okay, if I can't get you to drop your values, then we're going to drop you as a friend, or we're not going to be doing as much with you, so they don't call you as often. They leave you out of things. That's called marginalization. Ask your mom and dad if any of them, once they became Christians, that they had some pretty good friends and they tried to reach them for Christ, but their friends didn't come their way, and all of a sudden their friends left them. Or more painful than this, some of you young people are experiencing right now at family reunions a different dynamic at that family reunion than you had before your mom and dad trusted Christ as Savior. And why is that the case? Because they're being marginalized out. 
And so while we may not have a bullet or our head chopped off or burned at the stake or boiled in oil, there is still pain. And some of that pain is long-lasting pain because we love these people. And now we're left out of family reunions, birthday parties, phone calls. We're, we're just kind of marginalized out. And then you go into school, and you have the same thing with your classmates at school. And the worst ones that hurt you, watch, watch this, is you can be marginalized out by even fellow Christians who don't hold your values for the defense of the gospel and keeping the main thing the main thing. And so they then start marginalizing you out. And those of you here may not get promoted or get a job because of your separated life. It doesn't mean you're going to stand up on your desk and preach Jesus at them and you're blasting everybody with a gospel email. But it does mean that you've chosen not to laugh at a dirty joke or to go drinking with them on a Friday night. Or when you go drinking with them, you don't drink and they do. And all of a sudden, you're kind of left out of things. Or then they just stamp you in their mind, because they can't do it legally, unpromotable. And so then you kind of get plateaued out in your life while everybody else goes on around you. But can I tell you this? As long as, you, listen, listen, as long as you put Jesus Christ first in your life, no matter how painful it might get here, God knows and he always rewards you. Your payment back for your stand for him may not be now. It may not even be in this life. But I promise you, when you serve the Lord, he honors those. Listen to the verse. He says, if any man serves me, him will my father honor. No, don't put a calendar on it. Don't put a monetary value upon it. Put a faith in this thing and say, God, you're going to honor me. And when you have that, I'm going to tell you this will be the greatest thing for you. And this is where I get to suffer together in faith. Read it with me, will you? Read it out loud with me, will you? For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. So we could talk all about what kind of conflicts did Paul go through. He went through a whole lot of stuff. Some saw it, some heard it, but they all were aware of the conflict that he had. But go up to the first part about it. It says this, For to you it has been granted on the behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now look up here for a moment. Let's unpack that. How many of you right now would be willing to just, for whatever reason, give up your salvation and then forever go to straight to hell? How many of you are willing to do that? Not me. Not me. Okay, how many of you would want to give up your salvation just so that you can be accepted back into the family? You can have some of your boyfriends and girlfriends back because so you can get promoted. How many want to give up your salvation for that? I don't want to do that. Don't think so. Okay. So here it says that God says, isn't it good enough that we've been granted to believe in Christ? God says that's a, that's a gift to believe in him. Now, I don't want to go too theological with that, but look at it this way. God has so much chosen us out of all the people on the earth, chosen you right now, not only you, but you, to be able to come underneath the sound of the gospel. He prepared your heart for you to be able to receive him by faith alone. You then, convicted of the Spirit, responded to the Spirit, trusted Christ as your Savior, became a blood-bought, born-again believer. All that experience was that God says that was a gift from him. It was given to you, granted to you to believe. That's a blessing. Have any of you kids, any of you, all the adults, have you ever thought what it would have been like if today, right now, today, your age, today, you were born in the backside of the desert of Afghanistan? Where would you be today? What would your house, cave, donkey, look like? What would your health plan look like? What would your teeth look like? What would your fingernails look like? What would your health look like? But God says, okay, that's them. I have a program for my kingdom and eternity for them. But right now, it's all about you. God granted us the privilege to be born. And we live in Hawaii. Can you imagine that? Just tell your friends, you know. Do you know how hard it was? We're leaving our family. We're saying we're going to be pastors and kind of missionaries in Hawaii. Oh, yeah, big deal, you know, that was a hard thing. I'm in Hawaii, folks. We're in Hawaii. We get the beach. When was the last time you shoveled snow in Honolulu? You know, it doesn't happen. But even all of that, God granted you to believe. And why is it that it's okay for us to say, yep, believe, that's so sweet. But we don't want to have the suffering. Truly, you can't have the belief without the suffering. Because it's through the belief that you have in Christ and the public, uh, publicity of it, the publicness of it, you speaking about it, that really brings on that suffering. So you know what? I don't care how much suffering that we might have to go through. Because of our belief, I don't want to stop any of that if it's going to mean I then have my belief taken away from me. Because it all comes together. Now, 
It was interesting about the Apostle Paul because it was granted unto him to believe and to suffer. And he said, you are aware of it. You either experienced it or saw it, but you're aware of it. I'm wondering if it was like this. Now watch this. This is cool. This is cool. That God allowed the suffering to go to Paul's life. It became so public, it was found in Holy Writ, the Bible, so that people later on would read about it and say, you know what? He believed and he never gave up his belief to stop the suffering. In fact, he knew he'd have more suffering the more he talked about his belief, and yet he never gave up. And if he didn't do that, you and I don't have to do that. Take it another step further. Some of that suffering that he went on that became public to them, he did it with great joy. That's the whole book that we're studying, the book of Philippians. He did it with joy. So that means you and me, we can suffer whatever we're going to suffer together. At the end of this thing, it's because it was granted us to believe and to suffer, and with that, we can have great joy. Now, as I bring this whole thing to a close, I want you to look at the three things here, the, the two and then the subpoints, and we'll rattle through these. It's a gift to you to believe, and what suffering brings to us future rejoicing. Some of you are going through some marginalization of family. Some of you are being passed over at school. Some of you are not getting a promotion. Some of you are going to go through some stuff a lot worse than this because you're choosing to go into the ministry, and believe me, the pain that you have in the ministry is real. But the joy of it all is that you have future rejoicing. Number two, intimacy with the Lord. When you are going through the suffering, even though you believed, it's bringing you closer to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, when you suffer and you're all there by yourself, you know that Jesus went through that too. I've heard this testimony. I don't know how many of you have back problems. I mean, severe back, debilitating back problems that sometimes you either can't get out of bed or you have feet problems and you've got so much pain. And here's what some of those people that are Christian tell me. Do you know what helps them get through that? And, and, and it helps them. And here's what they say. If Jesus had his feet pierced, if Jesus had his back whipped, if he went through physical pain, like we have headaches, he had a headache too, but his was through the thorns. If Jesus went through all of that so that I could go to heaven then whatever pain I'm experiencing, even as a Christian, it is okay because I am identifying with Christ. I know just a little bit like a speck, a little, a little spark to the great sun of all the suffering Jesus went through. I can now intimately identify more with him. And this only brings more gratefulness from my inner core back to him for what he's done for me. So now your suffering helps bring intimacy. And then finally, number three, it gives you more opportunities to explain the gospel. You just don't quit. You just say, that happened, but that's all right. Just don't quit. To serve together in the gospel. Let's pray, shall we? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are one family here because of Jesus Christ. And yes, Lord, there are different uh, likes and dislikes, and we're coming together as we grow so we can even grow together. Father, we stand in awe of you. We stand in your presence right now. We thank you that our brother Paul, the great apostle, the one that was an ambassador for you, that has chosen to write a lovely letter to the sweet brothers and sisters 2,000 years ago in the city of Philippi, is the same sentiment that you have toward us. And these truths are meant for us to obey today as they were to be meant to be embraced by the people of Philippi in Paul's day. And Father, we may not be a big church, but our heart is right toward you. And we come before you now, and we ask you to help us to stand together in unity. They will major on the majors and enjoy each other's point of view, even though we're not there yet. And Father, help us to serve together in evangelism, that when we have ministries that are really trying to reach lost people, that we'd step up and be a part of that. And that, Father, if there's someone in here right now that has laid on their heart a ministry that we're not doing, that we would allow them to share that with us and figure out a way if you would want us to partner with them to do that ministry. That's not just ones we create. You may be percolating from within some good, solid, godly ministries. And so, Lord, I thank you for that new, fresh wind, fresh oil here. Help us to encourage one another, Lord. Be very sensitive to those that might have been startled by some opposition they weren't expecting and help them to go through that boldly. They might have dropped the ball, but we're going to come alongside them and give them an old-fashioned Christian hug and say we're there to help them sort it through and process it. And then, Father, that out of this group, if anyone is suffering, really suffering, that we will not allow them to suffer alone, that humanly we'll be there to take them to you. 
because you're the only balm of Gilead that can help them. So help us with that. Father, we love you. We magnify you. Bless these dear, sweet people today. In Jesus' name, amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.